Welcome everyone to our national webinar event. You know, as the, the Super Bowl draws closer and the gambling companies are intensifying, you know, this ongoing siege of sports gambling ads targeted at the American people. You know, the purpose of our event today is to, to really look at this massive storm of gambling advertising and promotions that has engulfed the United States and to really spotlight you know, why this is a dangerous threat to public health. So I am Les Burnell. I'm the National Director for Stop Predatory Gambling, and I will be moderating today's event. You know, our mission at Stop Predatory Gambling is to reveal the truth behind commercialized gambling operators to prevent more victims. And I strongly invite all of you to learn more about our work by visiting our website at stoppredatorygambling.org. Uh, we are fortunate to be co-sponsoring today's event with the Public Health Advocacy Institute at Northeastern School of Law. Uh, they go by the acronym PHAI. Uh, PHAI is a legal research center that's focused on public health law. They have current areas of focus that include tobacco control, childhood obesity, and predatory gambling. So just three logistical items for you uh, in the audience, just so you're aware of this. To improve the viewing quality of this webinar, we respectfully ask that you please keep your cameras turned off and your microphones muted. You will be in, you're invited throughout this event to ask questions by submitting them through the chat function on the webinar. And then lastly, I think you all saw it when you signed in, but this webinar is being recorded and our hope is that we'll have this, uh, be able to distribute this uh, later on today and later this week for folks who, who wanna watch it. Uh, and so before I introduce our two speakers, I'm gonna briefly recognize a, a couple of special guests in attendance today, uh, Tom Gray, is with us and Tom Grace started to reveal, reveal the truth behind commercialized gambling operators more than 25 years ago. And he's a central reason why there's a national US movement today for gambling reform. I also wanna briefly mention Dr. Guy Clark, who's the chairman of our national board for stop predatory gambling, you know, whose leadership has helped grow our organization over two decades. Uh, and then I also, it's really important to mention Dr. John Kent, who was with us, he is professor, professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois. Uh, he's been one of the nation's most preeminent scholars on commercialized gambling policy for a number of years. And he, he's recently served as the advisor to the must read uh, University of Illinois Law Review Symposium on commercialized gambling. And then as you know, we're, we have you know, supporters that kind of span the world. That actually, we have a number of supporters internationally and we have a few of them with us today. A couple of them uh, worth definitely want to mention, uh, James Grimes, who is the Director of Education for Gambling with Lives, which is based in the United Kingdom. Uh, James is a national leader in that country for gambling reform, and we're honored to have him with us. And then we also have Dr. Samantha Thomas of Deakin University in Australia. She's one of the world's top researchers about the impact of commercialized gambling advertising on kids. And uh, for all of you viewers, it's 4 a.m. in Melbourne. So good morning to you, Dr. Thomas, from all of us here in the US. Uh, now to our panelists. Our first panelist will be Mark Gottlieb. He's the executive, executive director of the Public Health Advocacy Institute at Northeastern School of Law. Uh, he is also a lecturer and a clinical instructor there. Mark is considered, without doubt, one of the top legal minds on public health litigation in the United States today. Uh, he has focused his research and his advocacy on tobacco litigation as a public health strategy for most of his career. But recently, he's he co-authored an article, Casinos and Addiction Industry in the Mold of Tobacco and Opioid Drugs, that was published in the University of Illinois Law Review. Uh, our second panelist is Harry Levant, who is the Director of Education for, here with us at Stop Predatory Gambling, and he is a public health advocate from Philadelphia. He's a former trial lawyer, who will receive his master's in professional counseling from LaSalle University in May of this year. Uh, he's a member of numerous professional organizations, including the American Counseling Association and Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers of Pennsylvania. Uh, Harry is also a gambling addict in recovery who made his last bet on April 27, 2014. And he has dedicated his professional work going forward to helping people and families to overcome the struggles with gambling addiction and other substance disorders. And, and Harry, uh, and, and you'll hear him today, really brings an uncommonly high level of expertise to this topic. 
because of his academic training as a counselor in addictions, his legal background, and his lived experience with commercialized gambling. So the first question I will pose to Mark Gottlieb is this, uh, Mark, as someone who's been at the forefront of public health litigation to protect the public from the harms that tobacco causes, you know, what's your reaction to this massive wave of commercialized gambling, advertising and promotions that's targeting the American people today? Well, you know, Les, thank you. Um, as, as you mentioned, you know, I direct the work of the Public Health Advocacy Institute at Northeastern University School of Law. And I've been here now about 30 years. So going back to the early 90s, most of my work had been focused on, on the tobacco industry. And I've seen how in that time, litigation, legislation and regulation have helped to dramatically reduce smoking rates and with it, you know, the public health impact of tobacco products. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get to your question, but I, I'm just going to start with, with the tobacco industry because, you know, back in the 1950s, cigarettes, you know, much like gambling today, was, was, uh, was a socially acceptable uh, product. And the companies that sold them were considered pillars of the community with, you know, enormous political influence. You know, they were actually considered the good guys back then. Um, and we saw wildly misleading and irresponsible, but highly effective cigarette advertising that was ubiquitous on, on television and on, on mag in magazines and, and on billboards. Um, and this was really important for the tobacco companies in, as they addicted to tens of millions, many tens of millions of Americans, almost all of them starting as teenagers. Um, but because most of the harm from smoking I mean, it takes decades to emerge, it took some time until we reached the point where we understood that smoking caused the early deaths of, of, of about half a million Americans each year, which is a lot. It's more than, um, uh, more than you know, all drug overdose deaths, gun violence deaths, suicides, and traffic deaths combined. And it's more deaths per year than we've seen at, even at the peak of, of the COVID pandemic. So those are the numbers today, even though we have much lower smoking rates today because much of the damage was actually done in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 1990s. And you know, while there were some voices back then sh sounding an alarm about cigarettes, they were often seen as just too moralistic and, and frankly sanctimonious, which sometimes may, may sound familiar. Um, ultimately though, it took a public health lens to understand the extent of the tobacco problem and how to get a handle on it. And it also took an acknowledgement that the industry itself was fundamentally dishonest and, and driven solely by, by a desire for profits and couldn't really be trusted as a partner. And I see many similarities between the gambling industry and, and big tobacco. And while the analogy certainly isn't perfect, the two industries do share some striking similarities. Um, you know, cigarettes are, are sold in, in packs where we fit in our hand easily and then provide their, you know, smokers with the ability to satisfy the addiction whenever their brains tell them that they need nicotine by simply reaching into their pocket and grabbing a cigarette. And until recently, you know, someone had to actually go to a casino or some betting parlor in order to place a legal bet. And now, in more than half the states, I think, gamblers can just similarly reach into their pockets for their phones to satisfy their need for action. Just like with addicted smokers, you know, more and more gamblers spend increasing amounts of time thinking about their next bet. But reassuringly for them, like a pack of cigarettes, you know, it, it's always within reach. And, and like advertising for cigarettes, you know, the goal of the industry is not only to recruit new customers, it's also to remind existing ones that now is the great time for a smoke or to place a bet or two or, or 20. Um, in addiction literature, you know, this is called queuing, um, and it's designed to make the customers go from wanting a product to craving that product and then actually needing that product just to feel normal. In this case, the product sort of changes the brain. And it's precisely because gambling can change the brain that it's now classified in the DSM-5 as an addiction disorder which is in the mold of, of you know, 
cigarettes and, and opioids. And I think, you know, today, Les, we're in like the 1950s and tobacco years when it comes to the gambling industry. In states with sports betting, you know, the advertising is absolutely saturating the market. And everyone in those markets, you know, is noticing it. It seems like it's overtaken ads for insurance, which I didn't even think was possible, and cars and, and even beer by a considerable margin. And with the, uh, the big game coming up and other games uh, coming in March, you know, we can see it increasing even more. Um, like the cigarette advertising of the 50s and 60s, the ads are often woven, actually woven into the fabric of the programming itself. They're not just standalone, they're part of the, the programming, um, which is what cigarette companies used to do. And, and also like the tobacco ads of, of the 1950s, there's very little oversight of this advertising. You know, much of it is simply guided by a voluntary industry code. And in the 50s, it was the code written by the Tobacco Institute. And, and now we have the American Gaming Association in 2022. Um, now, I realize that, you know, unlike smoking, gambling disorders, thankfully, do not cause lung cancer. Um, but we shouldn't underestimate what the long term public health consequences of, of ushering a, a generation of heavy gamblers, which which is now underway is going to look like. You know, we know that it will include risks to housing security and homelessness, increased domestic violence and intimate partner violence, um, obviously um, debt and the consequences of the debt, which includes, you know, family breakdown, um, and then, you know, depression and unfortunately um, even suicide. Um, and young people, particularly boys, are especially vulnerable. And judging by the advertising we're seeing, and where we're seeing it, the industry understands its most important demographic. And this, this kind of reminds me of the, the Lorillard Tobacco Company internal document that, uh, that was produced in litigation about their Newport cigarettes um, that stated that, quote, the base of our business is the high school student. And so it is here as well. You know, of critical importance, the harm is not limited just to the addicted gambler. It's estimated that you know every gambler suffering from some gambling related problems will adversely impact maybe between 6 to 10 other non-gamblers which could be members of their families, coworkers, friends and just members of the community. And so, you know, this isn't unlike the harms from secondhand smoke which is estimated to cause nearly 50,000 deaths per year. And, you know, is tolerated less and less and has been for the last uh 10 or 15 years. Um, and, and like smoking, in the case of gambling, the harms are, are often latent. It'll take years to really fully appreciate and be able to measure them. And, you know, like smoking, developing a public health informed policy response as soon as possible will be the key to limiting widespread harm related to the gambling industry's actions and products. Um, a public health lens you know, shows us the importance of policies of prevention rather than just treatments for the health harms. In, in the COVID epidemic, right, we, we can, which we easily see through a public health lens, since it's such an obvious public health issue, you know, it's clear that an effective vaccine is the key to prevention, not the medications to treat the sick. Um, and evidence-informed policies to place reasonable limits on the gambling industry can help to, in, in a real sense, vaccinate young people who all too easily can find themselves suffering from the consequences of an addiction to gambling. Now, Harry Levant knows this as well as anyone, and, and he'll go into some of the specifics less of, uh, of, of what the industry is doing in 2022 and, and why it's critically important to begin the process of reining some of this in before it's too late. Harry? Good afternoon, everyone, Les, Mark, and uh, everyone who has joined us today. Mark, thank you for the, uh, the kind words. Before I begin, Les uh, mentioned a few people who are here with us today, and it's always uh, risky when you start to mention names because you may forget to mention someone. Um, but there are a couple people I want to acknowledge who have joined us today, one of whom is uh, Arnie Wexper. Uh, Arnie was talking about preventing harm related to 
commercialized gambling long before anybody had any idea what a same game parlay is or knew what the internet was. Barney's been walking the walk uh, since the 1960s, and it's a privilege to have him here today. And I also know that we are joined by uh, the executive director of my program at LaSalle University, Dr. Leanne Cardacciato. And Dr. Cardacciato and her colleagues at LaSalle have been instrumental in helping me form my public health message and views related to uh, commercialized gambling and addiction and to build a bridge between my new career as a professional counselor and public health advocacy. So I'm grateful for Dr. Cadacciato being here today as well. Uh, we have mentioned a few times, or Mark has mentioned a few times, the words public health. And I think it's extremely important to focus on those words as we go through our, uh, our webinar today. The purpose of this webinar is to begin to draw attention to the public health issues that are inexorably linked to the explosive growth of commercialized gambling in America. As night follows day and day follows night, public health issues are arising in real time as commercialized gambling continues to spread through America. And when the United States Supreme Court decided the Murphy case in May of 2018, paving the way for the explosive growth of commercialized sports betting, the Supreme Court of the United States was deciding a case on federalism. It was not launching a public health crisis on America. But the result of what has happened is without question a public health issue in America. And as a result, it's going to be incumbent on Congress to act, the executive branch to act, and independent advocates to become educated and aware and understand and involved. And in that vein, I'm going to present uh, some facts for you. We're going to explore some facts and expose some truths about the rapid growth of commercialized gambling with an emphasis on advertising. So if you'd bear with me for just a moment, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. This is always the challenging part for me. I'm optimistic that and of course it is not there we are. Bear with me just a moment. Mark, if you can, when I get to the beginning, if you or less can confirm, you can see the stop predatory gambling label. Yes. Thank you. We have uh, labeled or titled our seminar, a new storm of gambling advertising, a threat to public health. A lot of my focus is going to be on the National Football League, but please understand we're focusing on the National Football League because the big game, or dare I call it the Super Bowl, is coming up in 11 days. And the National Football League is the unquestioned juggernaut of sports betting. And the model that has been created by the National Football League and its gambling partners is paving the way for what's happening throughout professional and collegiate sports in America. And I believe you will see from the facts that we present, this is a particular threat to public health. And of course it has frozen. So we'll begin by exploring some of the facts. For more than 40 years, the commercialized gambling industry in this country has campaigned for self-regulation. But today, we're in an entirely new and unprecedented world where technology, 
with phones, tablets, computers, and every electronic device is delivering not only access to sports betting, but casino gambling instantaneously. Advertising completely ignores the risk to public harm and does so through a program the gambling industry has itself created that they coin the responsible gaming movement. Let's take a look at what those words actually mean in real life and ask ourselves whether responsible gaming as promulgated by the gambling industry is actually sound public health policy. But before I go any further, I'm gonna switch terms because I don't think it's appropriate to refer to what we're dealing with as the gambling industry. Uh, Professor James Orford from Oxford has coined the term gambling establishment. And I think this is crucial to understand because we are dealing now not only with gambling companies, but we're dealing with gambling companies acting in concert and partnership with professional and collegiate sports, the NCAA, individual universities, all the major media titans in the world, the teams themselves, and most importantly, state government itself. The, those who we would have hoped would be involved in the regulation are actually partners in the gambling establishment. In 2021, as a matter of fact, people in America lost more than $50 billion to the commercialized gambling establishment. Mark mentioned the rapid uh, expansion of sports gambling. This map is actually now outdated. This shows as of January 11th, but now that we're into February, Ohio has come online. So we're at 31 states plus the District of Columbia, actually be 32 now, plus the District of Columbia that have legalized sports betting in the United States. What did this look like in 2021? The commercialized gambling companies spent more than $1.2 billion to acquire new customers. And this amount is expected to come close to doubling in 2022. And the issue becomes, once these customers are acquired, how are they being acquired? And what are the gambling, what is the gambling establishment doing with these customers? And how does it comport with the notion of public health? Because as Mark mentioned, as a matter of factual and medical and scientific certainty, gambling is an addictive product, just like heroin, opioids, tobacco, alcohol, cocaine. What is different and unprecedented here is that state government has joined in America with private industry to profit from the marketing and distribution of the addictive product. These words are pulled directly from the diagnostic criteria for gambling addiction. After losing money gambling, one often returns to get even or referred to as chasing one's losses. As we go through some examples of how the gambling establishment and the gambling companies acquire customers and maintain them and draw them into action, keep in mind this notion of the chase and begin to ask yourselves whether the model that we are seeing taking place in 2021, in 2022, is A, consistent with public health, and B, sustainable in any way from a public health perspective. I coin it the AAC model. Because the gambling advertising that we're gonna look at today is utilized by the gambling establishment to accomplish three interrelated concepts. It's designed to promote these three activities. And we're gonna look at a number of real life examples. And as we do, pay attention to access to action, how the gambling establishment is attempting to deliver to the public immediate access to constant action. And whether with an addictive product such as gambling, having immediate and constant access is consistent from a public health perspective. And again, the C is the chase, keeping people in action, chasing their losses for as long a period of time as possible. In many ways, commercialized gambling is just like science and math. 
the longer people remain in action, the more they wager, the more the gambling establishment profits. It can be no other way. It's how the product is designed. Much of that is a topic for future seminars, but it is a factual certainty that the longer people remain in action, chasing action, the more the public will lose as night follows day and day follows night. Now let's take a look at a few more facts from a public health perspective. One out of every two people struggling with a gambling problem contemplates suicide. The link between gambling, gambling addiction, and risk of suicide is real. It is here, it is amongst us. And one out of five will attempt suicide. I am one of those one out of five. For children and young adults under 25, the risk is even greater. Speaking of children, 39% of children under the age of 17 have gambled in the last year. 30% of those started before age 10. There is overwhelming evidence that the younger a child is exposed to gambling, the more significant the risk of harm. I wanna pause on this for a moment as we begin to look at real life examples of gambling ads and ask you, in addition to considering access to action and chase, I want you to consider a complete lack of any filters preventing children from being exposed to the real life examples we're about to look at. There is a direct connection between gambling advertising and a harm to children and young adults. Now let's take a look at some of the real life examples. Just last week, the state of Louisiana went live with sports betting. The ad that you are looking at was sent by Caesars Sportsbook's official gambling partner, Louisiana State University. I am an anomaly in college students, even at the master's level, I'm in my 50s. Most undergraduate college students are between the ages of 18 and 21, too young to gamble, but they received this in an email from Louisiana State University on behalf of Caesar Sportsbook. So let's take a look now at advertising itself and look at some of the truth behind how these ads are designed to work with a focus on action, access, chasing losses, and the direct exposure to children and young adults. And we're gonna start with a leading expert on commercialized sports gambling, and that's NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. Now, as I said at the start, I am not singling out the NFL. However, the Super Bowl is on February 13th. And as you will see in a moment, the NFL led the charge in America, which all professional sports leagues followed to develop a sports gambling model. But I believe once we go through it, you will recognize as a complete threat to public health because of its design. Commissioner Goodell himself once opined that once the character and integrity of NFL football has been compromised and bonds of loyalty and devotion between fans and teams have been broken, football will have been irreparably injured in a manner that cannot be calculated in dollars. Well, that was Roger Goodell in 2012. Apparently, as of 2021, Commissioner Goodell found a way to calculate it in dollars, and it begins with a B. It begins at $1 billion. Because in 2021, the National Football League named seven official gambling partners. The first five partnerships were valued in excess of a billion dollars. Two additional ones came online to total seven just before the start of the season. And how does this model work with an emphasis on advertising? It did not end with just naming the partners. The NFL also went into partnership with a company known as Genius Sports. In fact, we now know from Securities and Exchange Commission filings that the NFL has a significant ownership stake in Genius Sports. 
And the NFL named Genius Sports its distributor of all official statistics and data. And then said, uh, collected $120 million from Genius Sports and an ownership interest, and then said to their seven gambling partners, you are required to purchase your statistics on NFL football from Genius Sports. But why were they doing this? They were doing this for the creation of something called in-game betting. No longer is gambling relegated to who's going to win the game, how many points will they win by in the total points. As you'll see in a moment, gambling on sports is now each and every play, every 40 seconds or less in an NFL football game. But it went even further because what Genius gives to its seven NFL gambling partners, what they conveniently call customer acquisition tools and fan engagement solutions. In other words, data to bring people into action with access as quickly as possible and keep them engaged, keep them gambling, keep them chasing. That's what the relationship between the NFL, Genius, and the seven gambling partners means. Here is direct proof. This is taken from one of the seven gambling partners this past Sunday during the Kansas City Chiefs, Cincinnati Bengals AFC Championship game. You could bet on every play. This slide shows you that on the seventh play of a particular drive, People were being encouraged to bet, will the next play be a pass play or a running play? What I didn't capture for you, and this one, I, I, even I found slightly shocking. On fourth down in punt formation, the same gambling operator offered action on whether the punt would be a fair catch or not. Instant access to action to chase losses is the model. Let's take a peek at what this looks like in real life. And take note of who the star of this particular commercial is. Good to have you boys back. You know how it is. You never really left. Slow down, I gotta make my picks. You wanna this win bet with me? Win bet. I like where your head's at, but Boston's not covering. Sure they will. You gotta do what he says. He's driving. It's not a rule. Win bet, huh? Yep. Bet any game, any time, and you bet with win, so it's the best. Yep. Together. Hey! Hope you didn't bet on Boston. Down 30. You didn't bet on Boston? Nah. Didn't, none you got? Shaq, did you bet on Boston? I went with Greg on this one. He has a whole system. <laughs> big payout, big payout, big payout, big payout, big payout. Ooh! Mm -mm. Greg, man. Yes? OK. What is the Greg system? I pick by color, mostly. A team sport, according to WinBet. Ben Affleck, uh, well-reported to be someone who struggles with gambling problems. And it was the very end of that commercial that's most interesting. When Mr. Affleck, who has just lost, he bet on Boston, his friends all won. He puts his arm around someone looking for his next tip. Anyone who has ever lost a sports bet recognizes that moment. And that commercial itself is meant to appeal to someone who has suffered a loss. Get together with your buddies. Let's keep going. It was a commercial designed to keep people in action chasing losses. Walt Disney once said, our greatest natural resource is the minds of our children. In 2022, a Disney owned station in Philadelphia has sold the sportscast of its 6 p.m. evening news to DraftKings. So the broadcast that you see in the center of your screen is surrounded by DraftKings advertising at 6.20 p.m. as he reports on the Philadelphia Eagles. Mark mentioned the particular risk to younger men. Younger men watch sports on the news. Younger women watch sports on the news. Six-year-olds watch sports on the news. Look at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen and you will see a QR code. Anyone with a cell phone can simply hold their phone up to the QR code on a Disney-owned station in Philadelphia, and it will take you immediately 
to the Giraffe King Sportsbook and Casino. We talk about kids. Is there a better moment to be a sports fan than the World Series? Now it's the fifth game. Could be the deciding game. Bases loaded five, four, the count three and one, a crucial moment in the World Series. Take yourself back to sitting with a parent or a significant friend or relative as a child, and you're watching what was then your favorite sporting event on TV, the World Series. Three one pitch. That's inside, and this game is tied. A bases loaded walk to Martin Maldonado after the intentional pass to Bregman. And it's 5 5 here in the fifth of game five. Rick Kranitz out to talk. And now a quick word from DraftKings. Better, better. This postseason, bet $1 to win 100 if either team gets a hit. Download the app, sign up with the promo code, and make it rain. 5-5 five, five, World Series, Game 5. It would be nice if a 14-year-old daughter could turn to her mother or father and ask whether the pitching coach is likely to change pitches or there's going to be a pinch hitter next or what the strategy might be. But instead, now, without any filter at all, None. What you just saw is what took place on Fox in the middle of game five of the World Series. So we talk about a little bit about constant access. I got a quick look at this screen. This screen shows you something from 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, this past Thursday. The opportunity to bet whether the final score in a Danish basketball league between the Bears and the Wolfpack would be odds or evens. If you are even contemplating taking up the offer of betting odd or even on a Danish basketball league game at 1.30 in the afternoon from your phone or tablet or computer, you have met the diagnostic criteria for a gambling problem. Is this what was intended by the United States Supreme Court when they decided a case on federalism? Is this the type of access that is consistent with public health? So we talked about genius and we took a look at what it is to watch the World Series in 2021. Let's take a look at what it means to go to a game now in 2022. Not only did the NFL form gambling relationships with seven gambling partners, Commissioner Goodell has cleared the way for individual teams to form relationships. In Philadelphia, one of those relationships is the Philadelphia Eagles and DraftKings. So fans sitting in the stands, watching the game, don't even have to move. There will be QR codes displayed on the screen to assist people in making bets from their seat immediate access to action. Here's where you'll really see it on Vivid Display. Okay, so we didn't actually just scale a mountain. Casey here's afraid of heights. I told you that in confidence. Well, we did just hit the last leg of our points bet same game parlay, combining multiple bets all on a single game. And that's how you do more than just bet. That's how you live your bet life. New customers get risk-free bets up to $2,000. We're gonna talk about risk-free bets in a minute. What you were seeing there was a call to action. They mentioned parlay and same game parlay. Here's an actual picture of what a parlay slip could look like. Four bets on four random games. They tout that $100 would pay you $1,200. What they don't tell you in this chase for action is that the odds against hitting a four-team parlay are two to the fourth power or 16 to one. So if this were a fair wager, a $100 wager would pay you $1,600. 
the gambling industry touting parlays here, the gaming establishment in partnership with football is holding a 33 and one third percent advantage over the public. The point here is the action. You can bet a little to win a lot. And Drew Brees, a future Hall of Famer, mentioned the same game parlay. So while it used to be you had to take four separate games and combine them, now the gambling establishment will let you go inside each game and come up with your own four random events that change throughout the game. And it's not limited to just four. It starts at three, goes up to 15, with the odds always being a one-third house advantage but it's designed for people to chase immediate and instant action through the use of same game parlays. Now, Drew Brees mentioned the risk-free bet. Here's a combination of the risk-free bet, not just where he said a moment ago, $2,000, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, but here's how the individual player is solicited with the promise of something risk-free. Make a $10 risk-free bet on a parlay. It doesn't win, we'll give you your money back. But they don't give you your money back, as you'll see in a moment. They give you credits on the site to chase the losses. The very diagnostic criteria we were looking at earlier when we talked about DSM-5 and the chase being part of what gambling addiction is all about. And note here, this particular promotion is designed for the public to lose. Look at number three, wagers must have final odds of plus 400 or greater to qualify. For example, plus 450, plus 500. For those of you who may not gamble actively, the higher the number, the more the long shot. This is not designed to win. This is designed for a $10 player to lose, be given credits, and the chase is on. So let's take a real hard look at the danger of the risk-free bet. Caesars was promoting a $5,000 risk-free bet. Let's look at what it means. make sure you're saying on my first bet the caesar sportsbook app will cover any loss up to five thousand dollars yeah carl that's why i released those five thousand dollars five thousand dollars you're sure about that because that sounds carl are you paying attention the deal is good for all new customers except carl everybody give it up for the caesar sportsbook app everybody five thousand dollars the prominently displayed nfl logo and a 30 second commercial that promises you they will cover your bet up to $5,000. This is the chase of action and chasing losses. Let's look at what is really happening. First, there's no such thing as a risk-free bet. Next, the promotion requires you to make an initial deposit and bet $5,000. There are absolutely no affordability checks built into this promotion or this commercial. I have no idea whether the individual has the wherewithal to wager and risk $5,000, but they're being promised it is risk-free. We will cover, unless you're Carl, we will cover your bet up to $5,000. Again, no affordability checks, but your bet's not covered, nor is it risk-free for no money is ever returned or refunded. If the bet is lost, the gambling company gives you credits to wager on their site. Typically they give them in increments, perhaps five $1,000 credits, or sometimes they'll let you use the whole thing at once. But the design model is you've just lost $5,000. It's gone. It's in money heaven. It is never coming back. Here are credits to use on our site. The credits typically expire within seven days. Remember earlier, DSM, the chase, the gambling company is taking your money and giving you credits to chase on their site. This chase does not end with just sports betting. It's now being moved, and this is the model through the NFL's partnership with seven gambling companies. It's being moved into the online casino. Watch. All right, 
let's say I want to play blackjack, but I just want something quick while I'm sitting on my couch watching TV and there's like a commercial break. I'm glad you asked here. I think you'd love DraftKings' best-in-market multi-hand blackjack. They built a multi-hand blackjack game that is better than anything else out there because they know people want to play more hands faster, right? While most multi-hand games let you play three to five hands of blackjack at once, DraftKings Casino created a multi-hand blackjack game that deals out up to seven hands at once. So when you're watching TV and it's a commercial break, you can play more hands faster and easier than anywhere else. I used to go to the places to bet, but the app, you get it done whenever you want. If I'm in bed, I'm with my wife hanging out. Hey, 11 o'clock, oh, convenient, 100 bucks, I'm in. So I love it. What could possibly go wrong here? They offer faster action, more hands, more quickly, immediate access to faster action. Hey, you're bored during your TV commercial, pop into our app. You're in bed with your partner, make a quick hundred. The entire promotion is designed around faster access to more action. The very heart of where problems with gambling arise. Needing or wanting faster action is a warning sign of a gambling problem. And it is the direct approach in this commercial of DraftKings. They are reaching out to the public, offering more access, faster action. Hey, make a quick hundred. Again, the faster and more often and quicker a person gambles, the more the gambling company makes. DraftKings didn't stop there with the danger of the chase in the online casino. At the time, new casino players can receive a deposit bonus up to $2,000. That's right. New DraftKings casino players receive a deposit bonus up to $2,000. Plus, DraftKings is giving first-time players free credits to use on their favorite casino games. So don't wait. Download the DraftKings Casino app now. And for new casino players, get a deposit bonus up to $2,000 plus free casino credit. I'm going to ask everyone to just take a moment and either with a piece of paper next to you or in your own mind, answer for yourself this question. How much money does a person have to risk in the online casino to qualify for the $2,000 bonus? So all I want you to do is whether you want to put it in the chat, whether you want to write it down for yourself or just think it for yourself, it makes no difference to me. I want you to focus on the question. How much money under the promotion you just saw must an individual gamble and risk to qualify for a $2,000 bonus? The answer to the question is shocking. There's a couple of answers in chat. No one's gotten there yet. One person got close. In the interest of time, I will reveal it to you. You must risk, depending upon the game you choose to play in the online casino, $60,000 to $600,000 in 30 days. And if you don't meet that criteria, you do not receive the bonus. The access to action to chase, all in less than 30 days without a single screen. The commercial you just saw aired last Saturday as part of a 30 minute infomercial in Philadelphia five different times on Saturday morning. I go back to Commissioner Goodell, who in 2017 adopted in a sworn affidavit the words of his predecessor, Commissioner Taglia Bill, that the spread of legalized sports gambling would forever change and for the worse, what NFL games stand for and how they are perceived. Commissioner Goodell was right because the model that has been set up with the seven gambling companies, where they are paying billions to the NFL 
additional money to genius sports. And then individual teams are receiving money from gambling companies. Mandates that the gambling companies have to get this money back. They don't have a product to sell in the marketplace. They don't sell widgets or washing machines. They don't sell cars or homes or TVs. They have one product and their product is gambling action. The only way that the gambling companies can recoup their money is to draw faster and bigger action. The access to action and chase model. You have just seen it described. In 2018, you've just, you've heard it described by me and you've seen it in on video display in the advertising itself. Action to access to chase. What people need to begin to discuss is how this has happened in a little over three years. Well, again, focusing on the NFL for just a moment, right after the Supreme Court decided the Murphy case, Commissioner Goodell and the league went to their players union and did something unprecedented. They ripped up the collective bargaining agreement and formed a new one. Much of this will be the subject of another seminar down the road, but they did it so they could rewrite the constitution and take away the prohibition on gambling. The NFL now profits from the faster access to action and chase. That is the very model of sports betting in America that the 31 states and District of Columbia have signed on to, perhaps not even recognizing what is happening. And here's what the NFL has done in response. The NFL, apparently not learning anything from big tobacco, has donated $6 million to the National Council on Problem Gambling, saying we're here to help. In other words, the folks who are putting out the most dangerous aspects of the product. They're saying, we'll give you money to treat those who fall through the cracks. That is the antithesis of public health policy. The antithesis. Public health policy, whether you're a future counselor such as myself, a lawyer and public health advocate such as Mark or anyone on this webinar concerned, needs to recognize that it begins by controlling access to the product. The NFL and the National Council on Problem Gambling have done is gone and partnered up as a distraction to say, look at what we're doing. We're trying to help people, but we're not. We're not looking at this from the macro issue of how do we prevent harm in the first place. You'll see here the American Gaming Association, the International Center for Responsible Gaming, a gambling, both gambling industry groups are donating. They've donated to Harvard and the Division on Addiction to fund studies looking at treatment. And treatment is important, but having the gambling industry, the gambling establishment directly linked to the funding of treatment is unethical. It's unethical from a counseling perspective. It's unethical from a research perspective. And we in America need to look across the pond and we will see that in the United Kingdom, they are ahead of us on this issue. And these headlines hit on Sunday, where NHS is no longer accepting funding from the gambling establishment. Research and treatment must become independent of the gambling companies and the gambling establishment. That's why we're here today. That's why Mark is here today, to begin to educate the public on the need to get the gambling establishment out of the effort to fund how gambling is researched, how gambling is treated. This is a public health issue. The gambling establishment cannot be involved in telling us how to handle a public health problem. For the result becomes promotions, a $2,000 sign-up bonus that are asking you to gamble between 60 to $600,000. It was Frederick Douglass who said, Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. This is what we are looking at. It's the beginning of this crisis in America. It's a public health issue, just like tobacco. And what I hope we've been able to explain just a little bit today is how advertising is what we call in counseling, the tip of the iceberg. It's the piece that you can see. 
but so much additional public harm is going on beneath the surface. We hope to use the focus on advertising as a launching pad to begin to further educate the public on what the gambling establishment is doing and how it is completely inconsistent with public health. With that, I will return this to Mark and Les, and I thank everyone for your time and your attention. Thank you, Harry. Uh, so we have a, we got, this is an opportunity now to ask a few questions. We have a little, some time here to invite questions from the audience. And I'd like to take one of the questions that came in and, and Harry and Mark, I'm happy to either of you to take this one, but Mark, I'll, uh, Harry, I'll give it to you first is one question came in says, so if we were to break apart the current system, the corrupt system of the gambling industry funding treatment in America, uh, how, where would, the, where would where could potential funding come from to help people who are addicted from gambling? So Harry, I don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on where we could go as a solution if we break apart this corrupt system. I have a few thoughts on that, Les. And uh, there actually is, first of all, we need to look to our friends in the United Kingdom where this is happening right now. Um, and they are reviewing on a national level their gambling laws. We need to look and there are tremendous independent advocates in the United Kingdom. I think the, um, uh, Liz and Charles Ritchie from Gambling of Lives are on the call. Uh, there's a, there, there's, there are wonderful people in the United Kingdom from an independent standpoint who've been looking at this. But focusing here in America, there's actually a relatively straightforward roadmap. The first is that we eliminate the connection between the gambling industry giving money to the states and the state's giving money to the local affiliates of the National Council on Problem Gambling. And we look at this as a national issue because public health is a national issue. This needs to be attacked in a national way. So the first step is that we have a national and state levy on the gambling industry that goes directly to independent funding through NIH or CDC. More importantly, from a treatment perspective, when President Obama passed the Affordable Health Care Act in 2010, one of the provisions of the Affordable Health Care Act was to mandate that every health insurance policy in America provide both inpatient and outpatient, outpatient treatment coverage for addiction. Now, if you are struggling with drug addiction, alcohol addiction, there is funding under every health insurance policy in America cover that pursuant to the Affordable Health Care Act. The Affordable Health Care Act was passed in 2010. In 2013, the American Psychiatric Association, followed by the American Medical Association, followed by the World Health Organization, all recognized that gambling is an addictive product and that gambling addiction is an addiction on the same level as drugs, alcohol, tobacco, opioids, cocaine. Well, if the Affordable Health Care Act mandates coverage for every health insurance policy in America for addiction treatment, inpatient and outpatient, gambling needs to be included. And this should be an issue where the gambling companies, the NFL, the media titans, and independent advocates can all join together. Congress needs to recognize gambling as a full-fledged addiction, needs to protect the men and women in the military, both in uniform and out of uniform, and the general public. Once gambling is recognized as an addiction, health insurance coverage will follow. The money that states are currently using in a failed system, part of responsible gaming, can be allocated to independent research on the federal level. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, another question, and Mark or Harry, welcome to this, but in, and, and Harry, I don't know if this is something you're versed in enough, but can you, was a question that came in, can, can we speak to the gambling industry's presence on Capitol Hill and how it influences lawmakers at the state and federal level. I mean, I have some strong views on this, but I'd like to defer to our, our panelists if they want to weigh in on this. Mark, do you want to take this? No, I, mean, first? I, I think you want... Les, you're, you're probably the most well-versed on, on this, please. Yeah. That would have been my answer as well. Okay, sure. I, I throw that one back I just to wanted, you. you know, it was, without a doubt that the commercialized gambling industry is one of the top two or three most powerful special interests in the United States today. And, the, and you know, one is because the enormous amount of money they have uh, behind them. But the second uh, aspect that makes them so powerful 
as and we've kind of understated this fact in today's uh, webinar a little bit is the role of the state. Like this is a government program. Like these guys are operating in partnership with state governments. And so there's not a state attorney general in the United States that has ever brought consumer protection litigation against a commercialized gambling interest because state governments are partner. This whole business is illegal unless you partner with the state. So when the question is, you know, the, the, the gambling industry is arguably one of the most powerful interests in the country today. We just saw it in December when they rammed through the special interest legislation to, to legalize a, a off-reservation casino in North Carolina, which is one of the most appalling things I've, I've, I've seen happen in my 30 years of political life. Um, so without a doubt, these guys are huge players and it's because the state is a partner to it. So if you if your state government starts starts use, stops using this as a budget gimmick and gets into the business of protecting citizens from these predatory practices, the, the, the power and influence of gambling interests would start to, to wane somewhat. Uh, but but that's a, they'd be a big step in the right direction. Let, I mean, that, makes, just... that, that makes a lot of sense, Les. I mean, it's it's almost in, in many cases like the um, industry is paying the state protection money, but really their duty is to protect the people and, and, and the health of our people more, more than to protect these companies, which is, right. which is, which is what they're doing. Um, you, you know, I, I, I had um, talked about, you know, this reminds me of the 1950s with tobacco. And, and here we are, you know, 70 years later um, with tobacco. And, and, and still experiencing all of the, uh, the, the, the public health consequences of, of, um, of, of smoking over the past uh, generations. Um, it can't take that long for us to, uh, to take action uh, in, in regards to the gambling industry here. Um, you know, we learned, well, first of all, the gambling industry learned an awful lot from big tobacco, but we did as well. And I think we can we can respond um, through through our government through um, uh, you know foundations that can uh, I, I think need to step up and and sponsor research and and help with the advocacy around this and we can do this in in much less time and we really have to because the growth of gambling is unlike what we even what we saw with with smoking in the 1950s so. Um, it, it, the urgency is, is here, and I think we do have some insights um, that we can apply um, to really come up with common sense policies. I hate to put states in the position where they're profiting along with the industry, um, and that's the, probably the, the greatest challenge to, uh, to, to start to, to break that bond. And, and if I may build on that for just a moment, I think that there are, there are two approaches that need to take place concurrently. On the state level, I have spoken to enough groups and met with enough state legislators that I am of the belief there are a not insignificant number of elected officials who are unaware of exactly how this product is being delivered. Um, last month in the state of Colorado, for example, $13 million was wagered on Russian table tennis in the middle of the night online. I would like to believe that there are men and women elected officials at the state level who are completely unaware that DraftKings is promoting at 10 a.m. on television a, I hate to use the word bonus, but a bonus system that is literally designed to get people to wager more than they can afford. I would like to think that as independent advocates come together and make elected officials aware, there's an opportunity on the state level. I also am uh, wise enough to recognize that the true public health reform is going to require a federal approach. Uh, Professor John Kent from the University of Illinois School of Law has recently published an amazing law review edition that addresses this very issue. And, uh, when the United States Supreme Court made its decision in Murphy, while it did strike down PASPA and clear the way for this explosive growth of sports betting, that can also serve as an invitation for Congress to act on the public health aspects of this. So I would like to think, Les, that as people like yourself and many other independent advocates on 
this webinar right now, begin to get more involved with us at Stop Predatory Gambling at the Public Health Advocacy Institute, uh, that there will be momentum to take this awareness, bring it to the attention of Congress, and begin to get some intervention on the federal level, because that's really where I believe public health policy reform needs to take place. Sure. And so, Harry, this may be a little more, have you expand a little bit more on what you said, but this next question comes in at, you know, what are the prospects for the Federal Trade Commission to regulate these false claims in gambling advertising? What are the prospects that they might weigh in, knowing with the context that, you know, for the essentially commercialized gambling when it's partnered by the state has essentially been exempt from truth and advertising regulation. So how would, how would you approach, you know, organizations like the Federal Trade Commission um, to get them to start really hammering these false claims of advertising like we do for any of every other business in the United States? The, the end of your question is the beginning of the answer. Um, I am no longer an attorney. Um, I lost the privilege to be an attorney as part of the horrible things that I did in the grip of a pathological gambling addiction. Uh, so I am not answering this question with any legal expertise. I'm answering it from a position of a counseling student, a future counselor as of May, and a public policy and public health advocacy expert. I firmly believe, firmly believe that the public is unaware of how the promotions work. I believe this begins with education. When people are educated that risk-free bets are the very definition of gambling harm, whether it's the FTC, the FCC, the Department of Justice, Congress itself, there are multiple avenues in to address a public health problem. Because the meaning of the Murphy case was not open season on the American public with a dangerous product. So rather than starting with, this is what the FTC or the FCC should do, I think it begins with what the people who joined us today are willing to do, which is learn and open up a discussion. Because I don't, I don't believe we live in a country where it is appropriate for the government to look the other way as the National Football League partners with a gambling company and says on a Saturday morning on television, hey, we'll give you $2,000, but by the way, you're going to have to wager between sixty dollars to $600,000 to get it. That's not how our system is designed to work. So there are multiple pathways in, but they begin by us educating each other and knocking on doors. You know, you mentioned, Harry, that this is, you know, 10 a.m. on a Saturday. Um, but I think that the other purpose of that advertising is to target the the audience that that used to watch cartoons uh, on uh, on Saturday mornings. This would be young people. Um, and, you know, the the. the risk-free stuff may not uh, and bonuses may not mean that much to them but it certainly creates a very positive and uh, uh, image of what gambling is and sort of a reassurance that hey they got you covered you know nothing bad can happen um and it's and that is also directed at very young brains um watching those shows you mark you're, you're entirely correct and it i think it's even even worse when you think about where I believe the words risk-free are designed to go. As many people on this call know, I made my last bet on April 27, 2014. I gambled starting at the age of 14. I gambled for 36 years. Gambling addiction took me within 30 seconds of ending my own life. When a, uh, so I know a little bit about what it feels like to be struggling with gambling. Those words, risk-free bet, are designed for the person who is chasing action. They're not designed for the everyday player. They're designed for the person who needs to remain in action. The gambling industry knows it. The gambling establishment knows it. Independent advocates who understand gambling know it. There's no question about that. To your broader point, 
the issue of targeting an audience. Uh, you know, there, there, I am hoping that Les will invite us back to do more seminars moving forward because there's so much more material to discuss. Um, three weeks ago, Martin Luther King holiday, uh, that Monday, which I believe was the 15th or the 16th of January. I was home working on this presentation. I work better with background noise. I turned the TV on. The NBA does great matinee basketball on Martin Luther King Day. The Philadelphia 76ers were playing the Washington Wizards on NBC Sports Philadelphia, owned by Comcast, partner of PointsBet. I lost count while watching that basketball game at 2.30 in the afternoon, at 18, the number of gambling advertisements during matinee basketball that is designed for children who are home from school back then. That's why the NBA is on at that time. There are, you know, one of two things is true. Either state elected officials are blissfully ignorant about this and they're just turning the other cheek because of the money that's coming in or they're not yet aware. It's too soon to say, but on a state level, we have to be addressing these things because the facts speak for themselves. Good. So here, you, you touch on a point that one of the, the questions from the audience came up and that is, and it, we haven't really focused too much of the spotlight on them today. And that is the role of, of these big national media companies. So when, when, can you bring up the idea, we need to have a discussion about this, put a spotlight on it. You have many of these, of the national media companies who, you know, have great news organizations who report things at both at the national level and, you know, you have state capital news agencies who cover state capital news. Like people, these, many of these media companies are making money from the gambling industry. They're, they're essentially vested partners in this. So how do you, how can that discussion take place? How do we challenge some of these media companies to also break apart who are becoming really reliant on this profit center? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you have the discussion when, with a, with a, with the, when media folks are a kind of part of this, a part of this corruption right now that's happening, this this incredible blitz of advertising, we're profiting from predatory gambling. The, the, the reality is that the med, the largest media titans in the world have absolutely no financial incentive to have this discussion. None. I mentioned Comcast. Comcast owns a big piece of points bet. There's Foxbet, which is controlled by Fox Broadcasting Network. We can go on and on and on in listing these things. Associated Press, you know, gets I'm into it, but yeah, the, the ESPN, which is owned by Disney. So let's focus. And I showed a slide, not because I think that the evening news in on six ABC in Philadelphia is all that you know interesting, but. The 6ABC in Philadelphia is owned by the Disney company, the same company that owns ESPN. That company sold the sportscast of the evening news to DraftKings to put up a QR code. The relationships are so intertwined. Disney announced late last year that they're willing to auction off the ESPN brand to a gambling company for marketing purposes and the bids they project are going to begin at three billion dollars i am not naive enough to believe no matter how persuasive we might be that merely presenting these facts is enough this is where intervention on a federal level will be mandatory and that's for me that's why i chose to show the world series i chose to show the world series because it, is there anything more linked with the, the, the history of American sports than baseball in the World Series? And that was the middle of the fifth inning of a crucial game. So the idea that they're going to say, wait a minute, this is bad. The money that is pouring in is impossible to comprehend. But until this webinar, until you last at Stop Predatory Gambling said to us, will you begin to present these facts? No one in this country is talking about this. So Harry, one question that came in that it's important and, and, and we should really draw a spotlight on this because this is really what younger people are getting their information is we focused a lot on this webinar on the television aspect of the marketing and promotions. But can you spend a, just a minute talking about the social media marketing that's happening to people? Because that's really, you know, we, we've seen in, in other countries like the United Kingdom, 
the role that social media marketing has in getting young people hooked on gambling. So I'm wondering if you, what, can you spend a minute, a little bit about what, what's happening on that front? I'll be happy to. I also want to talk less tied to the social media are the digital platforms themselves. My recovery, fortunately, one day at a time is strong. I made my last bet nearly eight years ago. I can't begin to imagine the struggle. Actually, I can because I work with people every day. The general public can't begin to imagine the struggle that men and women are facing trying to break free from a gambling problem with the overwhelming access to action that these digital platforms present. I showed you a couple of slides. If you sit there on your computer and you literally watch every play. Um, I was watching Australian Open tennis, every serve in a tennis match, every swing of a golf club is another opportunity to bet. If you don't struggle with a gambling problem, it's not an issue. But for men and women, young and old, who struggle with a gambling problem, having the immediate access to action on these platforms, where they are offering you parlay bonuses and boosts. Again, much of this is for our next seminar and beyond, but recognize that it's not just the advertising on social media. It's once drawn into the platform. I showed our audience DraftKings commercial, seven hands of blackjack at once. These the draw to action is a reach out to people who are struggling. That's the profit center. And in regard to social media, you can't go on social media without hitting gambling ad after gambling ad after gambling ad. It's a more complicated area to regulate because it's the internet. It's not broadcast media in America. But all of this goes back to my AAC model. How are we going to deal with access to action and chase because all of the marketing and promotions and delivery of the product is designed to maximize for the gambling establishment, those three items. Again, that's why we looked at the NFL's model. It's all built around AAC. Oh, that you, that's, that's the insidiousness of the social media advertising is that it's, it's, it's on the device you're going to use for the the betting platforms, the gambling platforms, you've got it right there. So there's that access um, and opportunity is unprecedented. I think with any other product in terms of how the uh, social media can can influence behavior. And and that's why, Les, in future seminars we need to explore the fallacy of responsible gaming which ultimately says to the end user, it's your responsibility to make the correct decision. It's sort of like a magician who waves a handkerchief in the air while he's performing a trick over here. Pay no attention to what we're really doing. Look at this wonderful terminology we, 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 we use as a sword and a shield, responsible gaming. Well, you know what? If you're not for responsible gaming, what are you for? Irresponsible gaming? The, the, the title, resonates. We need to look at what it really means, because it is the antithesis of what Mark and his esteemed colleague and partner, Professor Richard Denard, do for a living, which is public health. Public health is the opposite of responsible gaming. Public health is we have to address how this product is delivered. We have to address the means of access and the action that the gambling establishment is delivering. That's, that's where public health starts. So we just have time for a couple more questions before we uh, finish up Harry and, and um, Mark. But one question that came in is, why do you think the, attorney, the, the US Surgeon General has not weighed in on the issue of commercialized gambling um, you know, over the years? They've weighed in on tobacco, they've weighed in on obesity, they've weighed in on you know, drunken driving. You know, what, what, why not commercialize gambling and, and what will it take, you think, to get the U.S. Surgeon General to, to use the cloud of that office to, to really put this on the map as a public health issue? I mean, there's, there's a, a cynical view that, um, that, you know, there is a pressure uh, on the office not to get involved. I, I think it's inevitable. Um, I, I'm, I can't tell you what year it's going to come out, but I would imagine within the next, you know, Three years, I, I, I would hope we would, there's there's enough uh, literature now I think to support 
um, you know, the type of, uh, of report that, um, that the Surgeon General's office would issue. I think it would be uh, a, a great service in terms of raising the awareness generally that this is not risk-free activity and a risk-free product by any means. But Les Mark is right. There's also, if we, if we choose to go the non-cynical route, which I choose to do for this webinar, a little bit of history is important. You know, gambling wasn't even recognized as a problem until 1980 when it was deemed an impulse control disorder. The medical community caught up in 2013 and recognized it as an addictive product as we discussed today. 2018 was the game changer when the Murphy case was decided. So from a non-cynical perspective, I would suggest that we are right now at the time for the Surgeon General, the National Institute of Health to get involved. I will also tell you that there have been efforts to fund studies, Mark mentioned at the beginning, about this being a public harm issue. Four other countries have looked at public harm and commercialized gambling and have found with independent research that approximately 16% of the general public is harmed on an annual basis by commercialized gambling. We've never had an independent study from a public health, public harm perspective in America. There have been proposals and the gambling establishment has shot them down. If the numbers are consistent in America and one would suggest they'll be larger because of the growth of online betting in America and media attention. But if they're even just 16%, we're talking upwards of 55 million people a year in America being harmed. When that becomes the public health model, the Surgeon General, the National Institute of Health, the CDC will be required to get involved. So the non-cynic in me says public health, public health, public health, and that's how we get there. So what I'd like to do before we wind down is uh, maybe Mark and Harry, if you have any, you know, one final thought you want to share with our webinar guests today, and then I'll, I'll close it out. Well, I'll just quickly say, you know, I think this was sort of my message throughout is, is that, you know, time is of the essence here. We are going to have latent harms. Uh, we don't want to wait for huge percentages of the population to be suffering these ill effects before we take action, because again, you know, they, they, these harms are latent. So um, prevention now uh, and as, as soon as possible is important. We can't wait. 50 years like we did with cigarettes. Um, we need to start to, to turn this around within five. Thank you. Harry? I want to, first of all, thank everyone for your interest and in attending. I want to thank Mark for co-presenting with me. And my closing message would be get involved. Public health matters. The things we've looked at today are, as I said earlier, the tip of the iceberg. And regardless of what side you think you come down on, public health isn't about sides. Gambling is an addictive product. What has happened in America since May of 2018 is a risk of public harm. And the harm is amongst us already and it's gonna get worse. It need not be that way, but the way things currently are are unsustainable, they are dangerous, and it's time to begin to work together to do something about it. I hope that this webinar delivered that message, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to present to everyone. Thank you. So for, for you viewers uh, who participated today, this webinar is gonna be a, on a, in a series of webinars that we're gonna do on commercialized gambling operators to reveal the truth about what's happening here. Uh, and before we sign off, I wanna recognize the work of three of my colleagues of our colleagues in this, uh, Kate Rossi, our development director, Eric Stamps, our digital communications director, and Debbie Blank, our financial manager, all of whom played a role in helping pull this event off. Uh, and then lastly, if you support our mission at Stop Predatory Gambling, uh, you know, I urge you to, you know, who, and our mission is to reveal the truth behind predatory gambling operators to prevent more victims. If you support the work we do, please visit our website, join our organization, get involved. And you can follow us uh, on social media as well at our, at our, at our locations. And also want to recognize, again, the, the partnership we have with Public Health Advocacy Institute in putting this uh, event together today. Thank you, everyone. And we wish you a great afternoon.